out there in the sun. If you're not wearing sunscreen right here, uh, it's Father's Day. And I figure, you know what we do? Um, a lot of times when it's Mother's Day and Father's Day, for years, I would, you know, I'd preach a message to, you know, fathers or I'd preach a message to mothers or whatever else. And then I kind of got away from that a little bit. And I, I, I just, I, I didn't want all these kind of secular holidays to determine what I was going to preach and just kind of preach through scripture. Well, today I'm doing the men a favor. All right. So I'm preaching about something that will make your life better. All right. It's a, it's a message about ladies again. And so I often wondered why, why are we preaching about things men need to do on Father's Day? We should be preaching about things ladies need to do on Father's Day and vice versa on Mother's Day. Why are we preaching about things ladies need to do instead of preaching about things men need to do? So you got a gift here. You got a gift here, guys. That's not why we're doing this. Um, but I mean, but it, it would be nice though, right? We're, we're in, uh, we're in first Timothy and, and what, what I've decided to do with no outside influence whatsoever, Paul Macaron had nothing to do with it, uh, is I've decided to switch the evening and morning messages. And we're going to do that for the next eight weeks. So the next eight weeks, we're going to be in first Timothy. And then for those of you who are following our series in numbers, our series in the law of Moses, That'll be during the evenings. There's no evening service tonight, but uh, next week we're going to pick up in numbers. For the next at least eight weeks in the morning, we're going to be in First Timothy. Today we're kind of finishing up what we started last week, that paragraph about a godly woman. And then, uh, and then next week we start a seven or maybe an eight-part series on uh, what he must be to be my pastor. What he must be to be my pastor from First Timothy 3 verses one through seven. There's a, there's a, I think there's a seventh or an eighth message. I can't remember how many off the top of my head, but the last message is kind of um, more like a, like a, an, a Bible study. It's more like extra biblical, it's, it's extra biblical uh, suggestions on being a pastor. I'll probably do that one on a Sunday night and then we'll see about coming back. I'll, I'll make a decision about what, what we're doing going forward, but uh, just kind of be prepared for that. We're, we're living in an age where anybody and whoever, any, anybody who wants to, you know, be a pastor, regardless of their qualifications, they just kind of, uh, they just kind of go and do it. So uh, I think it's an important message for our church to hear. Anyway, turn to 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2, uh, we're going to be in verses 11 through 15 today. And just kind of remind you guys, for those of you who maybe weren't here for our Sunday night studies, the Apostle Paul's writing a letter uh, to his protege to young Timothy, who's the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And what's happened here, I, I didn't send you any map or anything like that today, but what's happened here is this book is being written after Acts ends. So Acts, the book of Acts ends while Paul's under house arrest in Rome. Paul is released. He goes to Ephesus. He goes to like the western part of Turkey, Asia Minor area. He leaves Timothy there in Ephesus as the pastor. He himself goes over to Macedonia, to churches like uh, Philippi and Thessalonica and places like that. So he plans on coming back. Before he comes back, he writes this letter. And in this letter, it's basically, this letter is a letter written by a pastor and to a pastor and really for all pastors of all time. In this letter to Timothy, who's serving as the pastor of the church, probably around 61, 62, 63 AD, uh, Paul encourages Timothy to protect the church from false doctrine. He, Timothy needs to expose false teachers. He needs to warn the church about those who would harm it. Timothy needs to, as a pastor, manage the affairs of the gathered church. I'm going to tell you, that's not always the easiest thing to do because in a church of 100 people, you're going to have 100, perhaps at times, 100 different opinions, especially going through something like what we're going through right now. Everybody's got their own opinion. And nobody's ever done this before, and no one can know the future, and no one, no one has all the information. And so these are, no, no pastor can stand before a congregation and say, everything I'm doing is definitely the right thing. Nobody really knows at this point. You're just trying to use wisdom as best as you can. But Timothy needs to manage the affairs of the gathered church. He needs to teach men and women how to behave and worship. He needs to teach about the types of leaders churches should have churches should appoint. He needs to teach the church to pray corporately. And, and, and that's what we saw 
in really 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 8, really this focus on men, uh, men praying for authorities. We need to pray for those in authority. We need to submit to those in authority, not rebel against them, not resist them. That's a, that's a lesson our society really needs to hear. But we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. If you want to hear that, uh, ask Chad. He'll get you that message. Or just go on Facebook. I think you could get it. Uh, men are to pray that believers can live in peace. They're to pray that uh, the lost would be saved. But what about women? What about women? How should women handle the gatherings of the church? Last week we saw that uh, godliness is more important than appearance. Godliness is more important than appearance, uh, more important than looks. The godly woman focuses on her character more than on her looks. I'm going to say, you know, for, I, listen, I don't, I don't know anything about this as far as, you know, applying makeup and that type of thing. But I can say that uh, I can't imagine it probably takes much more than, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes tops to uh, maybe get makeup or something like that. Maybe it's longer. Lady, ladies, am I in the ballpark here? 20, 30 minutes makeup? Is that the general ballpark? Some are like, yeah, it takes me an hour. Some are like, it takes me five minutes. I don't know. But uh, I got to think a fair number is, let's say, 20 to 30 minutes. Is that in the ballpark at least? Someone give me a hand raise if I'm okay. Am I okay? I see Brielle going, eh, something like that. If you're spending 20 or 30 minutes on your character, and you're spending 20 or 30 minutes focusing on your character in a day, that's a problem. That's a problem. The godly woman is focused on her character more than she is on her looks. The godly woman, and we'll see this today, understands biblical submission. That's what Paul writes about in today's passage. The godly woman understands biblical submission. She understands submission when it comes to learning the word of God. Look at verse 11. Now, now we're going to deal with a difficult passage today, but I'm going to ask you to just kind of bear with me. Chapter 2, verse 11. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. Uh, in verses 9 and 10, it talked about women, plural. In verse 11, it shifts over to a woman. And that really kind of perhaps has this, this focus on the individual responsibility of each woman to learn Scripture. Women are to be students of the Word of God. They're to quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, the passage says. And it's a mandate. It's not like this optional thing, like a woman should consider learning. It's a woman must quietly receive instruction. It's vital for a woman to be a learner. It's vital that a woman be a genuine disciple. By the way, uh, the words here, receive instruction, it's, it's one word in the original language, <clears throat> and it's the verb form of the noun disciple. So uh, a woman should be discipled, is what it could be translated here. Uh, you might remember that Jesus regularly taught women. Can you think of any women that Jesus taught? Anyone? You got, you got to have to shout loud if uh, you think of any women that Jesus taught. Uh, Mary, who sat at Jesus' feet, right? Martha. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess you could kind of say Martha if, if you really want. Although Martha is kind of more known for not sitting at Jesus' feet and being busy about the work, but that this is this is this is true. What's that, Tom? Yeah, that's 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 right. What about uh, the Samaritan woman at the well in John four? Right, it's teaching her. So so we see instances where Jesus was teaching women and where Jesus took women seriously as disciples of, of himself. It, it is so important that women receive biblical instruction, especially in today's climate, where the world's telling them all types of different things. 
that are op- opposing his word. But in this passage, what's you yeah, kind of like the, you know, the uh, the elephant in the room maybe right now is is the way women learn in verse eleven. Uh, there's a certain way women are to learn. It says that a godly woman, quote, quietly receives instruction. And and what that's, we have to understand that in light of what we saw last week in verses nine and ten, where 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 the godly woman's focusing on her character more than she is on her appearance. And this is this is this is talking about submission. It's talking about she's not being the object of attention. She's not being a boastful usurper of authority, which we're going to see here in a, in, in, a, in a second. She's not in scoffing opposition to the leadership of the church. Even she is a humble and quiet learner of the word of God. You know, uh, men need to be the same thing. You know, men need to be humble learners of the word of God. Uh, This passage isn't saying, listen, woman, be seen and not heard. That's not what this passage is saying, even though some would try to make it into that. Uh, The word doesn't mean that they should never say anything. This this word quietly, uh, Greek experts say this. They say the idea is one of reverence, devotion, and respect. That's the idea here. Reverence, devotion, and respect. Would we say that men should have the same qualities? In the church, we absolutely would say that. Uh, and so it's not talking about complete silence, like let put, put the woman down, but it's talking about respect. It's not even saying that a woman could never give an answer to a question. I, I ask ladies, I ask questions publicly all the time in church, and, and ladies will answer. And most of the time, it's contributing to the conversation well. Just like men, most of the time, they're contributing to the conversation well. It's talking about attitude. It's talking about a reverent attitude of humility and of submission and learning God's word. The the idea of being quiet here, quietly receives instruction, uh, involves the idea of peace and submission. This is important. It's essential for any learning. By the way, pride and boasting, that gets in the way of any learning, doesn't it? Can you learn if you're proud? I mean, it's sometimes hard to, to learn when, when you're struggling with pride. And so quiet attention to the word of God is essential for learning. Humi- hum- humility and submission is essential for women disciples. A woman must quietly receive instruction with, look at, look at these words here, with entire submissiveness. Now, let me tell you what this is not saying. This is not saying that every woman should submit to every man. Just don't be confused about that. That's, that's, that's not saying that my wife needs to submit to, to any number of men that are in this room. Uh, your wife submits to you, not to other men. Of course, uh, she has to submit in all types of realms in her life. Uh, if, she, if she's employed, she needs to submit to employers. Uh, She needs to submit to the government. She needs to submit to her spiritual leaders. But so do you as a man. So most of these things apply to you as well. This passage is not about a man trying to put down a woman, put her under his thumb or control her. Uh, Paul's not saying that women should be suppressed. He's saying quite the opposite. He's talking about women taking an active role in discipleship. It's one of the main purposes of a local church is to glorify God through discipleship. And women are an essential part of that. Uh, Paul's talking about worshipful learning under a qualified man of God. And the pastor's responsibility is to provide a setting in which a woman could do that, which a woman could learn, in which a woman could accomplish that learning, accomplish that discipleship. I like what one writer says. He says this, quote, Paul counsels Timothy to make sure that in worship, each woman finds space to attend to her mandate as a disciple to learn. In other words, Timothy, you need to, uh, you, you need to create a, uh, a culture that's conducive for learning, not just for men, but also for women. Uh, this passage is not quite the same as what's being taught in 1 Corinthians 14, and and uh, I thought about whether I should read this, but, but I think it's important for us to, to read these things and understand as well. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35 says this, The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves, just as the law also says. 
If they desire to learn anything, and that's the key phrase here, if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. There's a, there's a little bit of a different context there, but the key phrase is, if they desire to learn anything. The implication is that, that in that passage, they don't understand. In 1 Corinthians, they have no positive contributions to make because they don't understand. All right, that's not exactly what's going on here in this command in 1 Timothy. Uh, in 1 Timothy, women are learning quietly with all submissiveness, but they're active disciples. Now, uh, these commands to women uh, can appropriately be applied to anyone who is learning, to any disciple. If I'm talking all the time, I'm not listening. I'm probably not learning. And so quietly receiving instruction is vital. I'll sometimes say, will you just be quiet? Sometimes I'll say, will you just be quiet and listen? I'll say that to my kids sometimes. Will you just be quiet and listen for a second? You're not going to learn anything if you're talking. Just be quiet and listen. Uh, And so quietly receiving instruction is vital and doing it with humility and submission is essential. Uh, Mark Farnham says, uh, a woman must understand her role as a submissive learner and embrace it, quote, without vocal restlessness. Mark Farnham said that uh, in his uh, class notes for the uh, pastoral epistles. And so a godly woman understands that submission is uh, essential in learning the word of God. Uh, She understands biblical submission when it comes to studying and learning the word of God. She also understands biblical submission when it comes to, listen to this, spiritual leadership. And so a godly woman understands submission when it comes to learning the word of God. Godly woman understands submission when it comes to the spiritual leadership of the church. That's not something that we like hearing in today's culture. This is not the type of message that uh, is going to get a ton of Facebook likes. In fact, we may have to remove a few comments on our Facebook page. (laughs) I, I, I imagine, but, uh, but this is what the scripture says. Look at verse 12, and it's very clear. Are you there? You're looking? I want you to see it on the page. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Paul is about to write about the qualifications of a pastor. Paul's about to write about how to appoint, what to look for when you appoint spiritual leaders, pastors and deacons. And he says these words, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Paul's saying here that women cannot have spiritual leadership in the church. That is, they cannot serve as offices, pastor and deacon. They cannot teach the adult body. They cannot have spiritual authority in that body. Verse 12, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Words that are spoken by the Apostle Paul as he's being moved by God's Holy Spirit. Words that are breathed out by God. Words that our society doesn't like to hear today. By the way, this is uh, the most controversial verse in the entire letter. It's one of the most controversial verses in all of Scripture. And you get to hear it today, right? Isn't that great on Father's Day? Uh, But it's only controversial because people don't accept it today. It was not controversial In the first century, it was not controversial to Paul or to Timothy or to the church at Ephesus or to the church at Colossae or to the church at Philippi or Thessalonica or or Corinth or wherever. It was not controversial in these places. It's controversial today because people don't accept the word of God today. They reject what God has said about it. As I said last week, our uh, people, people, even Christians, we're, we're influenced by our culture. And today's culture hates the idea of submission. And uh, feminism has strong roots in today's culture, very strong roots in today's 
culture. Feminist theology says that God's word is written by men who are trying to control women. Uh, By the way, a feminist believes in something, she may not realize this, or she may, believes in something called deconstructionist theology. Deconstructionist theology, think of it this way, constructionist theology, or, 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 or think about constructing something, right? When I construct something, what am I doing? I'm building, right? When I deconstruct, what would I do? I'm tearing down, right? So deconstructionist theology, this is, this is what happens. Any passage that's written that shows a male authority is deconstructed. It's removed as being authoritative, right? And, and, and now a new theology is created with any passage about male authority being removed from Scripture. The, 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 the idea in feminist theology is that the Bible is written by men who sought to control women, and so we have to take all those verses out of Scripture, Well, what is that? That is a denial of the inspiration of Scripture. That's a denial of the infallibility of Scripture, of the inerrancy of Scripture is what it is. Deconstruction theology is from the pit of hell. It's it's satanic. Feminist theology is, uh, is against Scripture. So don't let feminist theology affect what God writes to you. Now today, uh, people will invent all types of reasons to reject this passage. Uh, They'll say, uh, it was a cultural command. Uh, But the fact is that no one has uncovered anything in New Testament culture that would lead them them to believe that. The reason why they think it's a cultural command is because they don't practice it. Uh, People have invented, I like what one guy writes, all kinds of, quote, fanciful reconstructions of Ephesus in order for this passage to fit their theology. So they... So they, they create all these different kinds of contexts that out of thin air to try to explain this so that women can serve in these offices today. This is cultural. It was for Ephesus in the first century, but it's not for us today. And, uh, and there's, no, there's no reason to believe any of that. In fact, what we're going to see in a few minutes is that that would be against, completely against what this passage is teaching. But what I find interesting is that Feminist theologians will find verse 11 and verse 12 and 13 and 14. They'll find those verses to be cultural, but they won't find chapter 3 to be cultural. They don't find the qualifications as of a pastor, which are universally accepted as from God. They don't find that as cultural. They create all types of imaginative contexts in order to hold to this theological position, but what is undeniably clear, what is undeniably clear is that Paul says that women cannot be pastors. And then he supports that statement by appealing to scripture itself. So it's not like Paul's like, here, guys, I want to give you my opinion. And this is just for today, just for here and now. And let's move on to the next thing. It's like, no, no, no. This is a command, right? Uh, I do not allow. It's a prohibition. But there's a reason behind it. And there's biblical reasons. And I'm going to show you from the creation account those biblical reasons in a second. So any honest look at the passage disproves the so-called cultural views that are out there today. Uh, This verse is a command from God and must be accepted as such. Paul writes, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority. Now, some feminist theologians and otherwise, or or it may be not even someone that's a feminist theologian, but they're influenced by feminist, feminist theology. They're influenced by feminism. They would say, oh, I, I do not allow a woman to teach and exercise authority. That's in the present tense. It's present tense. So that was for Paul's present, but it's not for the future. It's not continuing beyond Paul's present. Uh, there's nothing in this passage that would suggest that timeless principles are temporary, first off. Second off, most of the New Testament, most of the commands in the New Testament are present tense. Almost all of them. So what would happen if we applied that type of a thinking to other 
passages, some of which just quote scripture, like this passage actually is going to quote scripture, but other passages that kind of quote scripture. What would happen if, if we say every command that's present tense, that's only for that day? Let me, let me, let me offer you a verse or two. First John 2.15, it doesn't say, do not love the world nor the things that are in the world at this present time, but you can love that stuff in the future. Uh, Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk with wine today in, let's call it 61 AD in Ephesus. Yeah, but in the 21st century, you could get drunk with wine. No, no, just because it's present tense doesn't mean it's limited in time and space. Most present tense commands are timeless. Again, people will invent all types of inconsistently ridiculous theories to reject what God plainly says in this passage. Greek expert Daniel B. Wallace. I met this dude probably about 10 years ago. It was a, it was a highlight. It was cooler than Ricky Henderson uh, speaking to me, although what Ricky Henderson said to me wasn't, uh, it wasn't the nicest thing. And Pedro Martinez didn't say the nicest thing to me either. It was cool kind of meeting and talking to those guys a little bit or whatever. But it was even cooler meeting Greek expert Daniel B. Wallace, who wrote the book. He wrote multiple books. He wrote a book this fat on uh, Greek syntax. And I own that one, and I own the skinny one too. The purple one that's skinny, I think it's purple, and the fat one that's green. This dude wrote the book, and this is what he says. He says that most of the commands in the New Testament are in the present tense and yet are timeless. Paul says, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Women are not allowed to serve as teachers over men in the New Testament. I know it's not something that people love to hear today, but this is what the scripture says. They're not allowed to serve in authority positions in the New Testament. That is, they're not allowed to serve in biblical offices. It's not some sexist, anti-woman perspective. This is what God says, clearly. And there are reasons behind it. By the way, this view is called complementarianism. Anyone ever hear of the word complementarianism before? Complementarianism. It's, it's, it's a big word, uh, but in, it's, it's just a way of saying that men, it's, it's a way of saying what Genesis says, that men and women complement each other. And I'm not saying, like this morning, I told my wife that she looks like a piece of candy, okay? I told her that. I said those words. I said, you look like a piece of candy. I did. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed at all. Um, I think it's a good thing. I think men and I think husbands and wives should compliment each other. They should flirt with each other. To flirt with someone else is a problem. But uh, I'm not talking about that type of a compliment. I'm talking about different sets of skills that come together and complement each other, right? Does that, does that make sense? Or different roles that come together and complement each other. Men and women have different roles. We're created equal. We have equal value, but we have different roles. This is the way God designed us. This is the way God made it. Uh, women who take the office of a pastor are taking positions that God has given to men. Kind of strange saying that, being a man. Seems, it's, it, it seems and maybe perhaps even sounds self-serving. It's also going to be strange talking about things like uh, the, bas- the, 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 the Bible talks about supporting, supporting pastors. That's a weird one to preach when you're a pastor, Right? I'm going to preach to you today about supporting pastors. You know, you just have to kind of ignore that stuff and just preach what God says. Uh, It's not surprising that many people disregard this today. These words, teach and exercise authority, uh, take a a look. Uh, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. They need to be considered. Paul isn't saying... And this is what some people say. Paul's saying that women shouldn't teach false doctrine. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul's saying women should not teach the adult congregation. They'll say, Paul's saying that women shouldn't uh, abuse authority. 
That's not what Paul's saying. Paul's saying women should not exercise authority. And so there's all types of, all types of twisting of Scripture that takes place by, by local churches even. There's a lot of local churches in this area that disregard what God says here. There are lady pastors scattered, littered all throughout the region. There's even a lady pastor littered relatively close to us that's in a lesbian relationship and has a kid. And so there's disregarding God's word on several fronts, okay? Or I don't know if they got the kid yet. Did they get the kid? I don't remember. They got the kid. We should love these people. They're made in the image of God. They're no less people than we are, but they're disregarding what God says. Uh, Spiritual authority is not part of a woman's role. Now, we know that women prayed in worship, 1 Corinthians 11.5. We know that women taught children in 2 Timothy 1. We know that women taught other women in Titus chapter 2. Another pastoral letter, a letter to another pastor. Uh, Older women encourage younger women to love their husbands and their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, and subject to their own husbands. Titus 2, verses 4 and 5. And so a a woman could teach other women how to practically carry out things of the faith, but she is not to hold teaching positions over the congregation, and she is not to hold authority over the congregation. She is not to hold leadership offices. I, uh, I had a lady some time back. She was upset with me for having some guy be over some ministry. This ministry was dealing with men and, and women. And, uh, and she said something like, you just want a man in a position of authority. And I was like, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know how to respond to that. I mean, <laughs> Maybe we should turn to First Timothy two. I mean, that might be that might be a thought, but um, you know, it's feminism runs strong in our culture. Deconstructionist theology runs strong in our society. Instead, look at verse twelve. The woman is to remain quiet. That is, she's to learn submit. It's the same idea. She's to learn submissively. She's not to debate or protest or create conflict. She's not to challenge the authority of the local church. She's to embrace her role as a disciple. Again, this is often lacking in churches today. Respect for leadership is often lacking in the church today. But Paul makes it clear that a woman should not teach or have authority over the adult congregation. If you're a woman and you don't believe in submission to your husband or submission to the leadership of the local church or submission at all, you're not a godly person. Not a godly person. If you believe that women should be pastors, you're rejecting what God makes clear and will make abundantly clear in the next two verses. Undeniably, abundantly, ostentatiously clear in the next two verses. If there's any question on the matter, if there's any question about whether women should serve in spiritual authority in the church, spiritual authority positions in the church, Paul obliterates any opposition to his thinking in verses 13 through 14. He obliterates uh, any, any, uh, let's put it this way. He supports his statement by appealing to biblical Timeless truth. So it's, again, it's not his opinion. And let's move on to the next thing. It's, I don't allow this. It's a prohibition. And this is why. Let's go to Genesis. Let's go to Genesis 2 and 3. Look at uh, verse 13. It says, uh, we'll read verse 12. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to learn quietly, but to remain quiet. Verse 13, For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. And so Paul's appealing to the creation account as support for his statement. Notice the first word there in verse 13, for. It's an 
explanation. He's giving the reason behind his statement. And the reason's not an opinion. It's Bible. It's Bible truth. It's not cultural and time-bound. It's scriptural and timeless. Adam was first created, then Eve. He talks about the order of creation. Woman was made as a help meet, a suitable helper. She is to complement man, not rule over him. In fact, that's what Genesis 3.16 says. It says this, your desire, I like the way, I like the, way the ESV translates it. It's close to being perfect in the original language. It's close to being perfect exactly what the Hebrew says. This is what it says. It says, um, God says to the woman, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. What it says in Hebrew literally is, your desire, what we're used to reading is this, your desire shall be to your husband and he shall rule over you, right? Is that how you memorize that? If you memorize it, ladies are like, I didn't memorize that. Are you kidding me? (laughs) That's the last verse I'm going to memorize. Um, but if you did memorize it, right, your desire shall be to your husband, but he shall rule over you. But what it literally says is this, your desire shall be for your husband's authority, but he shall rule over you. A woman is made to compliment man, not rule over him. In 1 Corinthians 11, Verses 8 and 9, Paul writes this, For a man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Paul's describing the creation account. There, a woman was made in order to serve as a suitable companion, to complement her husband. Women today, godly women today can find value and worth in carrying out their God-given role. Now, I'm going to tell you guys, you got to help you got to help a woman out. You know, don't make it challenging for her to submit. Don't be domineering, you know, don't make her a victim of your domineering forceful control. All right? That's that's not biblical either. That's not biblical either. Uh, but women today can find value and worth in carrying out their God-given role. Paul writes that the creation order is still in effect today. Men and women are, and this is, the, this is the term I want you to remember, equal but different. You've heard that term probably a million times, right? Men and women are equal but different. God gifted men with certain abilities. For instance, God made man, uh, gave man the responsibility to be a leader of the home. And he gifted women with other abilities. People today, they want those lines bur- blurred. They want those lines erased. They want the line between male and female erased. And even, even little ones, they're encouraging little ones to consider, are you really a male? Godly woman recognizes her God-given roles. Paul appeals to the creation order as support for his point that women should not serve in these offices, these spiritual offices. He also appeals to the fall of man. So it's not just the creation order, it's the fall of man that Paul appeals to in verse 14. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Eve was deceived first. She fell into the snare of the devil. Now, ultimately, Adam willingly followed his wife, right? Um, She was the one who was deceived. And when Eve took the lead, mankind fell. Now, uh, I'd like to challenge the men in this room for a second, because a lot of this has been about ladies, okay? Okay. Uh, when I talk about men and women complimenting each other, Titus 2 specifically writes about women teaching other women and children. Women can be really gifted at teaching other women. And they, they understand what, listen, most women understand other women better than I understand other women, right? I don't, I'm still trying to figure out women, okay? I'll be trying to figure that out for the rest of my life. But, uh, but women understand other women. They, they understand the things, you know, they understand things that women care about. And, you know, I, I mean, there, there, there's an aspect in which we all understand each other to a certain respect. But there are things about ladies I can't get. All right. There are physical things about ladies I don't understand and I don't want to understand. Okay. And vice versa. Women can be exceptionally good. And so, so can some men, not me so much, but women can be exceptionally good at teaching young children. 
women seem to be especially gifted at teaching young children. Uh, you just just look at look at VBSs across the nation, and most of the people who are teaching young children are are women, and they do a fantastic job. My wife does a fantastic job teaching our little ones. She is way better at teaching them than I I would be. Okay, I'd be like, so kids, I want to talk to you today about deconstructionist theology. You know, she's like, I want to talk to you today about sharing. You know, you know what I mean? Like, like she's she's just she's just in touch with it. She's in touch with them in a way that complements my leadership. But men, I'm going to encourage you. And, and, and these aren't universal. I'm not saying this is the case everywhere. I'm not saying that every woman is excellent with kids and no man is. I'm not saying that at all. So don't misunderstand me. Don't, don't make my words something they're not. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just stating the fact that I've recognized that women can be especially good at teaching young kids, better than many men. I remember one of the first times I was asked to teach junior church. And um, I was like, guys, I want to tell you today the story about Eli and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And uh, at the end of the story, Eli falls off. And I'm like, hey, you know, Hophni and Phinehas are killed. The Ark of the Covenant is taken. And then, you know, Eli, Eli's like this big fat dude. And he leans back on his chair and he breaks his neck and dies. And they're like, oh, oh, oh. the story was supposed to be about like the little boy who heard from God you know, Samuel, and turned into like, you know, the main characters all dying and the main character getting his neck snapped and because he was overweight. I just, this is not my speciality. You understand what I'm saying? But I can be a leader in the home. I can be, and, 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 and how I lead in the home. I'll do that with the kids sometimes. I'll give them some of those types of stories, right? Like, like Eutychus, the dude who fell asleep, the little boy who fell asleep in the whole sermon and died, you know, that type of stuff. But, um, but I can be an example to my kids. My kids will see me reading the word of God every day. My kids will hear me asking them, have you read the word of God yet today? Right? I'll keep my wife accountable on the, on the Bible studies that she does with the kids. Right? Okay, so, so what, you, you know, do you do Bible today? Whatever else, right? Because she does Bible with the kids every day. She does Bible class with them. All right? So there's ways, man, you can lead, even if you're not gifted at teaching little ones, right? But you do need to be the leader in your house. You do need to be a spiritual leader in your home. And that is lacking in our society. Read the word of God, study it, be a faithful disciple in the church, lead your family. In the church, the overseers were men. And that was based on what God said in his word. Uh, As I said, some women have a hard time submitting They have a hard time showing respect to authority. But some women can be very committed disciples. And women like this can be a pleasure to deal with. I'm going to offer you an example. I'm going to embarrass someone in our congregation um, in a positive way. I'm embarrassing in a positive way. Uh, Karen Gonzalez, front and center, right? You're at second base. She's like, oh, no. Oh, no. Her heart rate just jumped to like 140. Is that high? It's 140 high. I don't know. 170, whatever. Um, Karen has been faithful to our services for many years. I've been here for uh, 12 years. Can you imagine that? 12 years. I shouldn't be able to say I've been anywhere for 12 years, but I've been here 12 years and it's starting to show my grays. These outdoor services are really showing my grays. I'm trying to, you know, trying to hide it, but there's no, there's no hiding it. Uh, I know, Karen, I know that you don't agree with everything I do, all right? I know this, and I know that for most of the people in this church. I know when people don't agree, but when she doesn't agree, she handles it very well, and she shows a ton of respect, a ton of respect, and it's easy to pastor a person like that. I'm not saying saying you're the only one, all right? I'm just saying... It probably stands out because within the last couple of weeks, we had a conversation. I knew you disagree with something I was saying, and yet you handled it with a lot of respect. Um, and I was like, okay, if, if, you know, if, that's, if that's what it has to be, that's what it has to be. And, and, and that's, that's, that's respect. That's, that displays character and maturity. On the other hand, if someone's rolling their eyes and arguing or scoffing or being dismissive or saying, if I can't have everything exactly the way I want it, I'm not going to do it. It's, it's impossible to lead a person like that. It's very, that's not a God. That's a person who needs to look at their character. 
That's a, need, a person who needs to examine their maturity. Does this make sense, guys? The same thing is true for every man in this room. A godly woman understands submission and learning the word of God. She understands submission to spiritual leadership. The godly woman understands biblical submission. Godly woman also has a biblical ambition. Now, I've spent most of the time on verses 11 through 14. I'm going to move through verse 15 quickly, but I have to deal with verse 15 to a certain extent. A godly woman also has a biblical ambition. That is, she finds value in her biblical role. Look at verse 15. But women will be preserved, and that's really the the proper translation. I know some translations say saved, and that's, that's, that's not the right idea. A woman doesn't get saved by having kids, all right? She doesn't receive eternal life by having kids. Don't misunderstand what's being said here. The New American Standard has it right. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Context is key. Context is, we know from context, women cannot receive eternal life by having a kid, right? So it's definitely not talking about salvation. It's talking about value. The word could mean thrive, prosper, get on well. It could, it could say women will thrive through the bearing of children. That's really a, an appropriate way to translate that word. Uh, they'll be preserved or thrive through the bearing of children. They'll thrive in the experience of bearing children. Basically saying that a woman can find value in her biblical role. A woman can find contentment in her biblical role. Most women in Paul's day had children. Most women stayed at home and had children. They could find value in that. They can be satisfied in that role. A woman can find great value in life through her children, as opposed to grabbing authority positions that she's not qualified to have. Here, Paul writes about the complementary value of a woman. She's a suitable helper, and she can find value in that role. It's a privilege for a woman to bear children. It's part of what God has given to women. I understand that point's been downgraded today. Uh, Again, feminist theology, right? I understand that uh, our culture, again, wants to erase the line between the sexes, wants to obliterate the roles that God has for us. I understand that most people out there, most feminists today and most, most liberal people would, and liberal theologians and liberal politicians and whatever would look at a guy like me and say, this is a sexist guy. And I understand all that. I get all that. I, I, I don't know what to say. I'm just, I'm just trying to tell you what God says here. I'm just trying to tell you what the word of God says. Um, but uh, society stands against what God says. Society will strongly encourage women to enter the workforce while allowing someone else to raise their children. You know, I could make tens of thousands of dollars more a year if my wife were in the workforce. You know what we could do with that money? We could buy a nice house. We could have an in-ground swimming pool. I could go, I'd go to Hawaii, you know? I could do all types of things with tens of thousands of dollars. I don't know exactly how much I'd end up with at the end because of taxes. I, I don't know what type of tax bracket I'd move into, but I'd end up with more money, I can tell you that. My wife stays home to raise our kids, which is against what society would pretty much say today. Society would strongly aspire women to positions of leadership and even spiritual leadership. Uh, The Democrat Party understands that. That's why Joe Biden said before he even examined any candidates, before he even looked at the merit of anyone, he said, we're going to have a woman be a vice president. You know, 75% of politicians in the United States are men. 75% are men, 25% are women. And Biden has said, I'm ruling out 75% of our politicians just because they were born men. Why? Because I know society wants women in leadership and it's going to appeal to that group he wants to appeal to. It's going to get more votes. Society understands this. The Democrat Party understands this. They're catering to what society understands. Society belittles the prospect of being a stay-at-home mom. You, you don't work? You stay home? The career has taken the place of the home for the modern woman. 
Godly woman, though, has a biblical ambition. She finds value in a biblical role. Now, I'll say a quick word here. Uh, Perhaps you're not able to have children. There were women in the Bible who weren't able to have children. Perhaps you'll never get married or, or you're not married or whatever. You know, you can use situations like that to really be a servant of God without the extra complexities that little ones and marriage can often bring, right? I don't say inconvenience. I don't want to use that word, but complexities, right? There are times where, you know what I'm talking about. There are times where you just want to be reading the Bible and the kids are running around making noise or the wife needs your help with something or something like that, right? Complexities. You know, single people and people without children can use their time to really get closer to the Lord and have intimate fellowship with him. The godly woman has a biblical ambition, and this calls her to persevere in the faith. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith. Faith is a vital aspect, trusting in our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, If they continue in faith and love, which is a vital aspect, she carries out her faith and her actions. Uh, And sanctity or holiness, which is a vital aspect. She attends to her spiritual growth. And look at the last word there, last words, with self-restraint. That is, she can control herself. She controls her lust for desirability, verses 9 and 10. She controls her anger, her desire for her husband's authority, Genesis 3.16. She controls her desire for authority in the local church. And that's really probably what's in mind here in this passage. She controls her desire for sin in general. A godly woman understands biblical submission, and she has a biblical ambition. She understands submission and learning the word of God. She understands submission to spiritual leadership. She finds value submitting to the role that God has for her as a help meet, as a suitable helper, as a person who complements her husband. Again, it stands against what society tells her. It's countercultural. We're going to have to, uh, Andrew, we're going to have to monitor our Facebook feed, right? (laughs) A little bit. Um, Because society says, go out there and take charge. Society says, don't let any man tell you what to do ever. Don't submit to any man. You don't need a man. With all these ungodly, we might say satanic voices in a woman's ear, the godly woman has a lot, a lot to, she has an uphill battle. But if she places her faith in what God says, she finds value in it. God tells her about biblical submission, tells her about submission in hearing the word, submission to leadership, submission in the role that God has for her, doesn't make her any less than a man. In fact, in some ways, it can make her far better than most men because uh, too many men are too proud to learn in in humility. And uh, I found that many men uh, have problems with submission. So uh, pride doesn't make them stronger. It makes them weaker. So I encourage you ladies, this is the thought I want you to take home. It's the last word I'm going to say. I encourage you ladies to be humble and submissive, to embrace the role God has given to you, and to find value in that role. Uh, If you're here today and you're not sure you're saved, you can't do any of that if you're not saved. You, 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 You just really can't. You can't live in godliness if you're lost. Maybe you can understand some things about submission and that type of stuff, but you cannot really thrive as a godly woman if you're not saved, if you haven't placed your faith in the completed work of Christ on the cross. If you haven't done that, then come and see me, and we'd we'd be happy to, to share with you the gospel. You're here today, and you know you're saved, but uh, you you know you've 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 had difficulty with your lot in life. And today, man or woman, do you want to submit to the role that God has for you? Man, um, men, you want to submit to, uh, to being a biblical leader in your home? Uh, women, you want to submit to being a, a help meet, a godly help meet in your house? Uh, while we sing here in a moment, you can take that time to pray and uh, get your heart right with God. Paul, would you come and lead us?